بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, so today إن شاء الله تعالى we'll be continuing uh, with the life of عمر بن الخطاب رضي الله تعالى عنه and last time I had mentioned uh, the conversion story and so now today we will begin from a summary of the main incidents in the life of the Prophet وسلم, dealing with Umar ibn Khattab, i.e. what role did he play in the seerah. And we'll also mention uh, some of the verses of the Qur'an and also some ahadith pertaining to Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So today's lecture by and large should be a rehash of the primary incidents that we've already discussed in the seerah uh, regarding uh, Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And we begin from the very beginning of his conversion. And uh, the uh, conversion story, as we mentioned, uh, occurred uh, probably in the fifth or sixth year of the da'wah. And the very first day of his conversion proved to be the very first major battle that he had to do with the Quraysh. And that is a personal battle that um, he publicly prayed in front of the Kaaba, as is mentioned by uh, Ibn Hisham. And the, the Quraysh gathered around him one by one, bit by bit. And he was not able to pray continuously. And Ibn Ishaq mentions that he was fighting the Quraysh for the entire day. Like going back and forth, people irritating him for the entire day. Until finally towards the evening when he himself was tired. Uh, Al-As ibn Wa'il, the father of Amr ibn Al-As, passed by and told the Quraysh, why are you guys concerned? Uh, why are you bothering him? So what if he has chosen another path for himself? Let him be. And so Al-As ibn Wa'il uh, basically intervened and Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala was allowed to pray uh, continuously in front of the Kaaba. And we also mentioned when he immigrated, when he did the Hijrah, uh, Umar ibn Khattab was the only Sahabi who publicly announced the time and date of his Hijrah. Everybody else performed the Hijrah silently, secretly. Everybody else performed the Hijrah without mentioning to anybody. As for Umar ibn Khattab, he was the only one who basically said, that, O oh, Quraysh, I am leaving for Medina at such and such a time. So whoever wants to stop me uh, and whoever wants his mother to lose him, you can meet me outside of the haram at such an, uh, and such a place. And as we know, uh, the, uh, the Quraysh did not do anything to prevent him from emigrating to uh, Medina. So in Mecca, Umar ibn Khattab was the one who established the sunnah of praying in front of the Kaaba for the other Muslims. The other Muslims were not able to pray until he publicly uh, allowed the Muslims to do so. In Medina, it is well known that he participated in each and every battle of the Prophet wasallam without exception. And in fact, this is an honor that is very, very rare. The bulk of the Sahaba uh, were not able to participate in each and every battle. In fact, even of the four Khulafa, who can tell me, uh, incidents where even of the four Khulafa certain, certain of them were not able to participate Uthman did not participate in what? Because of his wife So he did not participate in? Badr in Badr. Of course Abu Bakr we mentioned already He was also one of the few who participated in each and every battle without exception So Abu Bakr and Umar Both of them share a very unique honor Which is very 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 rare And that is Every single battle without exception. As for Ali radiallahu an, what happened with him? Badr? No, Khaybar was definitely. That was the. He was Badr and Uhud and Khandaq and Khaybar. So what did he miss? Tabuk. Why? He was put in charge of the Al al-Bayt and the affairs of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So, uh, and of course, this is not an excuse for them. I mean, I mean, uh, sorry, it is an excuse for them, excuse me. Of course, it is an excuse. Both Uthman and Ali have legitimate excuses. Uh, but the point is that it is very rare for a Sahabi to have participated in each and every uh, battle. And in each and every battle, Umar radiallahu anhu has certain incidents. I'm not going to go over all of them. This is just a quick rehash first. 10 minutes of today's lecture is a quick rehash. We should know all of these incidents. So in the Battle of Badr, uh, Umar ibn Khattab was the one who answered the Prophet ﷺ when the Prophet ﷺ said, what do you suggest we do? I want to go attack. What do you suggest? And Abu Bakr was the first to stand up and said, O oh, oh, Messenger of Allah, do as you please, we will follow you. So the Prophet ﷺ praised him, asked the question again. Umar was the one who then stood up and the same 
answer was given. And then a third and then a fourth until finally the Ansar understood that he's asking for them. So Umar is the one who stands up second after Abu Bakr. Uh, at the Battle of Uhud as well, at the Battle of Uhud as well, Umar al-Khattab was one of the small group of 10 or 12 who managed to find the Prophet ﷺ at the end of the battle and stay with him. And so he was of the elite guard of the Prophet ﷺ. And therefore, when Abu Sufyan and Khalid ibn al-Walid were looking for the Prophet ﷺ, and they shouted out, Abu Sufyan shouted out, Is Muhammad still alive? ﷺ? The Prophet said, Don't respond to him. Then he said, Is Abu Bakr still alive? He said, Don't respond to him. Is Umar still alive? Don't respond to him. Then Abu Sufyan said, These people have all died because if they were alive, they would have responded. So Umar could not keep his composure. And he shouted out. They're in the mountaintops. They cannot see each other. But you can hear across the valleys. So Umar shouted out that, كَذَبْتَ يَعْدُوا Allah. You're lying, O enemy of Allah. And Allah has allowed all of them to live to see a day to humiliate you. So all three of us are alive. So Umar was the one who in his anger he couldn't bear it. He shouted out to uh, Abu Sufyan. And so Abu Sufyan, uh, Abu Sufyan responded, U'lu Hubal. Hubal has won. Long live Hubal. Hubal is the grand. And here the Prophet said, respond back to him. Respond back to him. When he is... Honoring the gods, you cannot be quiet. So Umar said, what should I say? And this is Umar here. So the Prophet said, respond back. That, uh, Allahu mawlana wa la mawla lakum. That, Allah is our mawla, you have no mawla. So uh, the point is that Umar ibn al-Khattab was the one whom, who is responding back and forth with Abu Sufyan. Um, as well, oh, of course, in the Battle of Badr, I forgot to mention the brief incident at the end of the Battle of Badr when the Quraysh are buried in that well. It was Umar who asked the Prophet, O oh, Messenger of Allah, are, can they hear you right now when you're having a conversation with them? And so the Prophet said, Yes, O oh, Umar, they can hear me as well as you can right now. They can hear me as well as uh, you can. So Badr and Uhud, a lot of incidents take place. Uh, in the Battle of the uh, Ban al uh, Mustaliq, uh, Ban al Mustaliq, the one the uh, when the small skirmish broke out between the Ansar and the Muhajirun because of two of their kids playing, two of the young people playing, and the Ansar and Muhajirun lined up to actually probably engage in, in, in a fist fight, and the Prophet became angry at them and said, even while I'm amongst you, you're still doing this, stop it immediately. That's when Abdullah ibn Ubayy bin Salul said, just wait, when we get back to Medina, لَيُخْرِجَنَّ الْأَعَزُّ مِنْهَا الْأَذَلْ the ones who are noble will kick out the ones who are not noble, meaning the Prophet ﷺ. And this was one of those many instances, I'll mention four or five of them in the next ten minutes, when Umar said, Da'ni adribu unuqahu ya Rasulullah, let me execute him, O Messenger of Allah. And how many times, in fact, this phrase is famous on the tongue of Umar. Nobody else has said it like Umar. Over and over and over again, at least a dozen times. Now, uh, it's so famous, we kind, of, we kind of are tickled at it. But the reality is, what does it show about the ghira, about the love and the protective jealousy that Umar has for the Prophet wasallam over and over again? And even today, we'll mention four or five. Uh, so this is one of them, where he's saying, I want to execute this man. How dare he calls you al-adhal? How dare he calls you al-adhal and he calls himself the uh, noble person? And so uh, the Prophet wasallam, of course, calmed Umar down and did not allow him to do, to, to do that. What was the excuse that the Prophet used? Why did he say we shouldn't execute him? What will the people say if they hear that the Prophet is killing his own companions? Right? It's a PR move as well. You look at maslaha, you look at overall uh, good. Uh, in the Battle of Khandaq as well, we have incidents of Umar al-Khattab. The most famous one is Mutafaq Ali Bukhari Muslim, that the Prophet uh, that Umar came angrily to the Prophet وسلم, cursing the Quraysh. Cursing the Quraysh. Because he said, O Messenger of Allah, they were in battle with us so severely that I was not able to pray Salat al-Asr and the sun has set. Shagaluna an Salat al-Wusla Salat al-Asr. They have kept us busy even up until uh, Maghrib time And the Prophet ﷺ said Even I have not prayed Asr And so they all prayed Asr Qadha 
And this is the only time we have in the seerah that the Prophet ﷺ uh, made the salah, yani qada. And this was, uh, according to one opinion, before the battle, uh, before the salat of war had been revealed, salat al khawf had been revealed. And according to another opinion, it was so difficult they could not even pray salat al khawf. Uh, and this is the only time we have in the seerah that the Prophet ﷺ is awake and he does not pray on time. Of course, we have the incident of Fajr oversleeping. But the other uh, times, of course, this has never happened. Uh, and this is the only time it happened. And Umar is the one uh, basically alerting him and getting irritated that the Quraysh have, that the Quraysh have uh, delayed us from paying Salat al-Asr. Uh, in the incident of uh, Hudaybiyah, in the incident of Hudaybiyah, uh, of course, the famous incident takes place where... Umar ibn al-Khattab is furious at the Quraysh for what he thinks the Quraysh have the upper hand. He's angry that how come the Quraysh have the upper hand? And in his anger, he questions the Prophet in a manner that even he himself regrets. And he questions the Prophet in a manner that Abu Bakr himself criticizes him for. And Abu Bakr rebukes him for uh, questioning the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And again, uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab, yani, Islam needs people that have so much love and, 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 and uh, jealousy for Islam. It needs people that sometimes their temperament, uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab was not able to phrase the question in the best manner. And he himself said, I regretted it and I made up for it with many, many deeds. Meaning, as remember what happened in the Hudaybiyah, that the treaty seemed to be in the favor of the Quraysh and not in the favor of the Muslims. And Umar ibn al-Khattab went to the Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, aren't you the messenger of Allah? Yes, I am. Didn't Allah send you? Yes, He did. Didn't you promise us that we would be doing tawaf? He said, yes, I did. I didn't say this year. I promised you I didn't say this year. I said, we, it's, it's not this year. So he kept on asking. Then he said, how can we accept humiliation in our religion? If you are the messenger and Allah has sent you and you have the book and we are upon the truth, aren't we upon truth and they upon batil? So when he keeps on answering yes, so then the point is, how can we accept the lower standard? And this shows us Umar ibn Khattab's, again, jealousy and protection for Islam, a positive jealousy. This is a ghira. Uh, and he himself said, because of my um, questions, I did a lot to make up for those deeds. So the Treaty of Hudaybiyah as well, Umar plays a prominent role. In the conquest of Mecca, in the conquest of Mecca, once again, a number of things happen, uh, both before and during the conquest of Mecca. Uh, of them is that uh, when the uh, Quraysh realized that the Prophet might possibly be invading, they sent Abu Sufyan to Medina as an emissary, as an envoy. And Abu Sufyan tried with his daughter, Umm Habiba. And he tried with Abu Bakr. And he tried with Umar to get an audience with the Prophet ﷺ and to have shafa'a and a promise that the Treaty of Hudaybiyah would not be broken. And this shows us how the situation has changed, the power has changed. The Quraysh realized they cannot fight. Look in simply eight years, seven years, from Badr to the conquest of Mecca. Seven years have gone by. And the Quraysh realized we cannot fight. And so they send Abu Sufyan with a group begging the Prophet ﷺ to keep the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. Right? Let's not have any war. They're not in a position to fight. Because they know that something has happened. Remember they, there was the breaking of the treaty between the two tribes that had fought. And the Quraysh supported that tribe in fighting against the Muslim tribe. And so Abu Sufyan uh, approached Umar ibn Khattab. And Umar said, do you really think I will help you against the Prophet ﷺ? Do you really think I will take your side and try to help you against the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Wallahi, if uh, you know, and he gave, and he gave a phrase in Arabic: No matter what you do, no matter what you could do for me, I would never be on your side against the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And uh, before the conquest of Mecca, the famous incident also occurs with Hatib ibn Abi Balta'a, the Sahabi who, as we mentioned, he was not a Qurashi, but he lived amongst the Quraysh, and his family was there, his wife and children were there, and he was worried that they might be slaughtered by the Quraysh. And so he sent the secret message that the Prophet ﷺ is leaving for Mecca, and his niyyah was, Allah will protect you, o, o Messenger of Allah, but by me telling the Quraysh, my wife and kids will be protected. So his niyyah was not to be, astaghfirullah, a traitor, but 
the love of his family got the better for him and he slipped and, and he did something he should not do. Once again, Umar was the one. And again, the famous phrase that this is a munafiq, how can, uh, let me execute him. And so the Prophet Sallallahu said, no, o, o Umar, uh, do not kill him. So then he repeated the request and this is the only time he repeated the request. And he removed the phrase he is a munafiq. Now that the Prophet said he's not, not a munafiq, so he says, still let me kill him, meaning for treason, for treachery. Even if he's not a munafiq, this is the punishment of spies. We cannot allow a spy to basically spill the beans for the future. We have to execute him. And so the Prophet made an exception for Hatib. This is an exception for Hatib. And he said that, O oh Umar, how do you know if Allah Azza wa Jal has not forgiven all of the people who participated at Badr? And Hatib is a Badri. And he said, Allah said, O people of Badr, do as you please, I have forgiven all of you. So Hatib's status and maqam allowed him to be forgiven even for something that an average person would not be forgiven for. Okay, and that is treachery, treason. So you look at the pros and cons of a person, you look at, we talked about the benefits when we did that, but again, this is Umar ibn Khattab, and he's twice asking to uh, basically take uh, 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 revenge against Hatta for this mistake. And in the actual conquest of Mecca, when the Prophet ﷺ is marching into Mecca, and he camps the night outside of Mecca, Another famous incident occurs, which again involves Umar ibn Khattab in one of those beautiful stories that uh, when the Prophet ﷺ is one night away from Mecca, the next morning he's going to enter Mecca, and Abu Sufyan does not know what to do because Abu Sufyan is the most powerful chieftain. He's the default leader of the Quraysh right now, and he's worried for his own life. And Al-Abbas meets him and convinces him to go directly into the camp of the Muslims and to meet the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Abu Sufyan realizes, I have no other choice. I have to now go and meet the Prophet directly. How is he going to enter the camp? Everybody wants to kill Abu Sufyan. And there is no treaty of Hudaybiyah. And there is no pact. There is nothing. And Abu Sufyan is a free for all. Anybody can kill him if he wants to. So Abbas says, come with me on the donkey that the Prophet has given to me. So remember in the story, the Prophet had given Al-Abbas the donkey to go. And so and he didn't, Abbas did not even know he was going to bump into Abu Sufyan. So he met Abu Sufyan and he then said, come with me, cover yourself up, come behind me on the donkey. It's nighttime. Nobody will recognize you. They'll let me pass because I'm Abbas. They'll let me pass and we will go straight to the Prophet and I will beg him to spare your life and give you protection. And so... Abu Sufyan, is there? A... Hmm? Okay. Uh, and so Abu Sufyan covers himself up and gets on the donkey of the Prophet, ﷺ, which is being led by Al Abbas. And Abbas maneuvers his way through the army, and the people are protecting the Prophet. ﷺ, so they look up, they see Abbas on the donkey of the Prophet ﷺ with somebody, and so they ignore because this is. The donkey of the Prophet, the uncle of the Prophet, whoever he must be with, must be somebody who is safe. So they don't really pay attention, and he's kind of covered up, you know, covering his face as much as possible. Until they get to the inner defense, and there's Umar ibn Khattab. And Umar is not going to let anybody through without verifying. And so Umar peers closely, who is this man on the donkey with Abbas? And Umar recognizes Abu Sufyan from the eyes. You know, we all can recognize people. Like this. So Umar recognizes Abu Sufyan and he says, Alhamdulillah, Allah has gifted me to you when there is no aman and no protection, and now it's just me and you. Okay? And Al Abbas says, O oh Umar, he is under my protection. And Umar says, This is Abu Sufyan, nobody can give him protection. This is the Ra's al Quraysh. And Abbas and Umar began going back and forth until Abbas basically insist on going to the Prophet Sallallahu and resolving this. So the both of them rushed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the both of them began to basically uh, get angry at one another, Abbas and Umar, over the fate of Abu Sufyan. And Abbas uh, basically says, I have given him protection, you're not allowed to, to basically execute him. And Abu Sufyan, and uh, sorry, Umar says that this is the Ra's al-Quraysh, this is Ra's al-Kufr. He's the head of Kufr. And if you look at what he's done, He's not a Muslim, Abu Sufyan, at this point in time. Remember, he accepts Islam, 
after the conquest of Mecca, even that grudgingly in the beginning. In the beginning, it's really grudgingly. He'll, he'll accept, uh, sorry, he'll accept Islam the next morning, sorry. Grudgingly. Remember, the whole night, Abbas had to convince him. The whole night. And then very grudgingly he accepted Islam. Then slowly but surely Allah blessed Iman into his heart. And later on he has uh, uh, many incidents where he demonstrates his real Iman. Right? But right now he's definitely not a believer at this point in time. He has not said the Shahada. And so Umar is saying he is worthy of being executed. And then Abbas gets angry at Umar. And Abbas says that you are only saying this, O Umar, because he is not from the Banu Adi. Because he's from the Banu Abdi Manaf. And had he been from the Banu Adi, you would not have said it. But because he's from the Banu Abdi Manaf, you want to execute him. Now, uh, remember, a little bit of ge genealogy. You should all have memorized this back in the day. Um, the, the clans of the Umayyad and the Banu Hashim are both the sons of Abd Manaf. Okay? So Hashim and Abd Manaf are brothers. Sorry. Hashim and Umayyah are brothers. And their father is Abd Manaf. Okay? So Hashim, Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib ibn Hashim. Okay? So Hashim and Umayyah are blood brothers. So Abu Sufyan and Abbas are much more closely related than Abu Sufyan and Umar, and Abbas and Umar. And in fact, as we mentioned, out of the four Khulafa, Umar ibn Khattab has the furthest lineage, the Banu Adi, eight generations back from the Prophet ﷺ. Whereas the uh, Umayyads are three generations back. And the Arabs and the Quraysh in particular, this is of utmost importance to them. And so Abbas says, we are the Banu Abd Manaf, Umayyah and Hashim. We are the Banu Abd Manaf because Abu Sufyan is of the grandchildren of Umayyah. And of course, Abbas is of the uh, grandchildren of Hashim. So they're both basically second cousins. And they're saying, this, you're only doing this because you're Banu Adi. And you don't like the Banu Abd Manaf. When he said this, Umar completely changed his tone. He said, Mahlan ya Abbas. Calm down, O oh Abbas. You crossed the line basically. Calm down, O oh Abbas. For wallahi, the happiness I felt the day you accepted Islam was greater than the happiness I would have felt had my own father, Al Khattab, accepted Islam. And that is only because, not because of you, that is only because I know that your Islam would be more pleasing to the Prophet ﷺ than the Islam of my father if he, if he had embraced Islam. So this really shows us the love of Umar ibn Khattab to the Prophet ﷺ. That, oh Abbas, you crossed the line, you shouldn't have said that. There's nothing to do with tribalism here. You are Banu Abd Manaf, and your embracing of Islam brought more happiness to me. His father has passed away. As I said, in all likelihood, it doesn't appear that even his father saw the beginning of Islam because we have no record of him whatsoever at all in the era of Islam. So his father passes away, but he's saying, if my father had been alive and he had embraced Islam, the happiness of your Islam is more important to me than the Islam of my own father. And this is a very beautiful and powerful phrase that really uh, demonstrates the love that the Prophet, that Umar had for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Once again, after the battle of uh, Hunayn, when the Prophet is distributing war booty, again Umar makes this famous phrase, let me execute him, when the head of the group that's going to be the Kharijites, when the person whom the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, from his progeny are going to come the fanatics. From his progeny are going to come the people who you will think they are very religious, but they are very evil. You will think their prayer is better than your prayer, their salah, their, their zakah, and their siyam is better than your siyam, but they will leave Islam like an arrow leaves its target. Enter and exit. Just like an arrow leaves its target, they're going to leave Islam. And the person, uh, uh, of course, was the one who uh, was the chieftain of the, one of the Nizdi tribes, and he said, I'dil ya Muhammad. Be fair, O Muhammad. 
وسلم. Why was he saying this? Because he didn't get the amount of money he thought he deserved. The tribal chieftain did not get the amount of money he thought he deserved. And so he came up to the Prophet وسلم, and uh, he is described as a man with a shaggy beard and a large forehead uh, and basically looking gruffy like the Bedouins uh, of the old and uh, accusing the Prophet وسلم, of not being fair. And the Prophet وسلم, said, Woe to you! Who else will be just if I am not just? When the one in the heavens trusts me, you on earth are not going to trust me? Now you have crossed the line. This is of course kufr to accuse the process of not being fair. And once again, Umar. Now again, the point being, in every single incident, who is the one who feels the most offense? How dare this man do this? Who, how, who is this person to do this? And so he asked permission continuously of the Prophet wasallam. And this is again one of those ins- instances where he basically says, allow me to execute this uh, person. Um, moving on in the Battle of Tabuk. What did Umar do in the Battle of Tabuk? The Battle of Tabuk, you all know this. Draw your memory. How did he demonstrate his piety? He brought half of his wealth. He brought... Half of his wealth in the battle of uh, Tabuk, and that was when he tried to compete with Abu Bakr, and then said, "Forget it, I'm never going to compete with Abu Bakr um, again." And on the way back from Tabuk, as well, he played a role in that uh, the Sahaba were starving of hunger, and some of them asked permission to slaughter their own animals to eat for meat, and the Prophet gave them that permission. Then he was the one who went to the Prophet and said, "O Messenger of Allah, if you were to do this, then we will have a problem." Uh, in our rides back Why don't you do this Is to get all of the food That we actually have Whatever little it is And make dua to Allah To bless us in that food So whatever little we have We'll all share equally together And so every sahabi brought Whatever he had One date Five dates Whatever Whatever bit they had Until there was a pile of food And the Prophet ﷺ made dua And so they then all ate From those, um, from those provisions Because of course the barakah came down with the dua of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and this shows us as well uh, that uh, Umar bin Khattab's uh, if you like foresight in uh, preventing the animals to be slaughtered um, moving on in the seerah in the final sickness and the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once again although this is rehashed that's why I'm going over it quickly but just to re- uh, remember and um, uh, revise our memories because it's always healthy to go back and, and revise our memories uh, so in the Final days of the Prophet's life, a number of incidents happened involving Umar ibn Khattab. Uh, of them is the fact that Umar ibn Khattab led an entire salah while the Prophet was sick. This was the first salah that the Prophet was not able to actually go out. Remember the story that Bilal came in and three, four times he kept on saying, It's time to pray, it's time to pray. And the Prophet tried to get up and he could not do so. So then he, uh, he said to Bilal, uh, now riwayats differ here. Did he say to Bilal at this point in time, go get Abu Bakr? Or did he simply say, uh, he cannot pray, have somebody else lead? And either way, in the end, uh, when Bilal went outside, uh, Bilal went to another sahabi, Abdullah ibn Zum'ah. And he said to Abdullah ibn Zum'ah uh, that who should lead the salah. Abdullah ibn Zum'ah tried to find Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr is not there. He was in his wife's house. Abu Bakr was not there. So he said to Umar, you lead, O Umar. And so Umar ibn Khattab led the salah. And Umar had a loud, booming voice. And so when the Prophet heard his qira'ah, he said, where is Abu Bakr? For Allah and his messenger do not allow anybody except for Abu Bakr. And so when the salah finished, uh, Abu Bakr was found And from then on Abu Bakr led every single salah For the next 3-4 days Until the Prophet ﷺ passed away Remember he stopped coming outside on Thursday And he passed away on a Monday morning after Fajr And so Umar bin Khattab led one salah And Abu Bakr led the remaining salah And it is said that Umar rebuked Abdullah ibn Zum'ah And said Why did you tell me to lead? I thought the Prophet ﷺ commanded you to tell me Otherwise, why would you tell me to lead? And Abdullah bin Zum'ah said, we couldn't find Abu Bakr, and I thought you were the best person to substitute when Abu Bakr was not there. And perhaps this is an incident that no matter how weakly and indirectly, 
it indicates that Umar ibn Khattab is indeed worthy after Abu Bakr. Not only because Ibn Zum'ah chose him, which is clearly an indication when he said, we couldn't find Abu Bakr, so I thought you were the best person for the job, but because, and this is from my ijtihad, if I'm wrong completely, and may Allah forgive me, I haven't found anybody else saying this, but it's interesting to notice here that in those final days, Abu Bakr and Umar are the only two people who lead salah in the process of the masjid when he's there sick. And no other sahabi ever led in the mihrab of the Prophet when the Prophet was in Medina, when he was physically in Medina, obviously when he's gone, when he's not there, then of course, when he's in Medina, the only two people who led in the mihrab of the Prophet are Abu Bakr and Umar. And Umar, no doubt the Prophet said, go find Abu Bakr. And we want Abu Bakr. But look at the phrasing. He did not reject Umar at all. Rather, what he said was, Allah and his messenger refuse anyone when there's Abu Bakr. Which might seem to indicate when there's no Abu Bakr, then go ahead and choose Umar. So, and this is a very indirect in, uh, indication. As I said, if I'm mistaken, it's, it's, you know, may Allah forgive me. But there doesn't seem to be anything wrong in extrapolating this. That the Prophet is not saying, how could you have chosen Umar? And Umar is not qualified. Rather, he is saying, as long as they're Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr has to lead the salah. Nobody else is allowed to lead other than Abu Bakr. So Umar is only qualified to lead when there's no Abu Bakr. And that's, in essence, exactly what happened. And uh, therefore, as we said, there is some indication that the only two people who ever led any salah when the Prophet was present was Abu Bakr and uh, Umar for just one salah. Um, We now move on to the next section of today's lecture, and that's really uh, somewhat new, even though some of these incidents we've already mentioned. And that is uh, verses from the Qur'an, and specific a hadith that occurred as a result of Umar. Incidents from the seerah and a hadith and verses from the Quran that occurred as a result of Umar ibn Khattab. Because the persona of Umar ibn Khattab is so important and interesting that a number of verses of the Quran were revealed because of him. And Umar ibn Khattab himself is a famous narrator of hadith. Unlike Abu Bakr who did not really narrate that many hadith, not because he didn't have knowledge, Time did not allow him to. Umar has narrated over 570 ahadith of the Prophet ﷺ, and that is a huge number. Far more than Abu Bakr, far more than Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhum. Ali narrated more because Ali also lived much longer. So Ali is narrating more because he's living much longer than Umar. Uh, but between Uthman and Abu Bakr, Umar is the one who narrates far more ahadith and over 500 ahadith are found narrated by Umar ibn Khattab. As well, at least maybe some scholars have said up to a dozen verses were revealed because of something Umar said, because of something that Umar radiallahu anhu basically caused. And this is a, a, a subsection of the sciences of the Qur'an. The sciences of the Qur'an, they talk about causes of revelation, sabab al-nuzul. And within sabab al-nuzul, there's another subsection, the people who were the causes of the Qur'an being revealed. And this applies to the Sahaba only. And also the, um, the, the, the Quraysh, the pagan Quraysh, when verses were revealed about them, but this is not a blessing for them, this is a curse for them. And it is a blessing for the Sahaba. So the Sahaba would compile amongst themselves who has the most number of verses revealed because of them. And they would obviously, it's a matter of pride for them. And Umar ibn Khattab probably has the greatest number that we know of. Umar ibn Khattab probably has the greatest number that we know of. And so we have verses of the Qur'an because of things that Umar did or said. And we'll mention some of them that we know for sure. Um, Of the most famous of these narrations, Umar himself said, وَفَقْتُ رَبِّي فِي ثَلَاثًا I agreed with my Lord in three matters. I agreed with Allah in three matters. And he is saying this out of adab because you're, you cannot say, Astaghfirullah, Allah agreed with me. That would not be appropriate Islamically. Even though Umar was the one who basically suggested it. But of course, Allah's knowledge already had that Umar was suggested, right? So then Allah then revealed a verse confirming what Umar suggested. But Umar cannot say, 
Allah agreed with me because that's totally wrong theologically. So out of adab, he said, I agreed with Allah, meaning, what does it mean agreed with? I happen to coincide with the verdict of Allah. I said something that Allah then affirmed what I said. This is the meaning of wafaqtu, I agreed with. In three things, and there are more than three, but he is mentioning these three. Number one, he said, that I was the one to first suggest to the Prophet wasallam that, O Messenger of Allah, why don't you take the Maqam Ibrahim as a place to pray? And so Allah revealed, وَاتَّخِذُوا or وَاتَّخَذُوا both of them, مِنْ مقام إِبْرَاهِيمَ مصلح. Take the Maqam Ibrahim as a place of prayer. Number two, he said, I said to the Prophet ﷺ that, Ya Rasulullah, both evil and good people enter your household. So why don't you ask the Ummahat al-Mu'mineen to take hijab? And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed ayatul hijab. وَإِذَا سَأَلْتُمُوهُنَّ مَتَاعًا فَاسْأَلُهُنَّ مِنْ وَرَائِهِ hijab. This is Surah Al-Ahzab. Right? Now, remember I said this uh, before just to remind you. The Quranic term hijab does not mean the headscarf. This is a modern connotation of hijab. Our sisters and us, when we say hijab, we actually mean the headscarf. Does she wear hijab? Means a headscarf, okay? I wear the hijab means the headscarf. But the Quranic term for hijab is a physical curtain in the room dangling from the, from the ceiling. A room that has a physical barrier. And the Quranic term for headscarf is khimar. Khimar is the headscarf. And the wives of the Prophet ﷺ had a special ruling that no other woman has. And that is, their khimars and their jilbabs are not enough. They have to have a third layer beyond that. And that is the hijab. So even their bodies in their hijabs, in their jilbabs and their khimars should also be covered when possible. When possible, of course, they could leave their houses when they needed to. But they should try even more than what regularly is done. And so Allah Azza wa Jal says very clearly, if you want to ask the mothers of the believers for anything, ask from behind a hijab. And that is why we have authentic narrations that when, uh, after the death of the Prophet the Sahaba would ask Aisha for something, they would say, and so she spoke from behind the hijab. Or she said this from behind the veil. And Urwa, who is the nephew of Aisha, uh, so Asma is his mother, and so Urwa, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Asma is his grandmother, Urwa ibn Zubair, uh, and Zubair is uh, the son of Asma. So Urwa is the grandnephew of Aisha. Urwa is one of the few people who would tell us that uh, I was with Aisha and you know, she, uh, she lifted the hijab so he could see the grave of the Prophet ﷺ. Because Urwa is no mahram. Urwa is a mahram to her. He can go in and, and whatnot. Uh, and so uh, the point is that Umar is saying the verse of hijab came down because of me. I was the one who uh, asked the Prophet ﷺ to do this and then Allah affirmed it by revealing the verse of hijab. So this is the second one he mentions. The third one he mentions was that when the Prophet ﷺ had a dispute with his wives, so this is the famous one month uh, dispute, and we'll talk about that again, that Umar played an instrumental role. I was the one who went to some of them to chastise them, to put them in their place basically, that don't do this, don't do this, come back to the process. And he first went to his own daughter Hafsa. He first went to his own daughter Hafsa, and he was very strict. Of course, he's the father. He has every right to be strict with his daughter. And he rebuked his daughter that look at what you've done and because of your tongue and because you spoke up and because you did it, you should not. Um, and then Umar is Umar, he went to other wives as well to chastise them. Like why are you disturbing the process in this manner? And uh, of course, Aisha is also the son of the daughter of Abu Bakr and she will not be quiet when Umar is talking to her in this manner. And so she says, oh Umar, don't you think that the process can manage his own affairs? He doesn't need you. Like, why are you coming and telling us what you think we need to do? 
And so Umar ibn Khattab says that, be careful, be careful. It is possible if he divorces you, Allah will give him better women than all of you. Okay, now he's including his own daughter. Like he's including his own daughter. And after this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed, عَسَى رَبُّهُ إِنْ طَلَقَهُنَّ أَنْ يُبْدِلَهُ أَزْوَاجٍ خَيْرٌ مِنْ كُنَّ مُسْلِمَاتٍ مُؤْمِنَاتٍ قَالِتَاتٍ تَعَبَاتٍ To the end of the verse. So explicitly the same thing that Umar said. That if Allah wills, He can give women better than you. So the same phrase that Umar used, eventually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed it in the Qur'an. So Umar says, I agreed with Allah in these three things. Is it only these three things? No. There are other incidents. What is another famous incident that what Umar said eventually became Qur'an? Badr, excellent, Badr, right? Badr, the incident of Badr, that uh, the prisoners of Badr, that the suggestion of Umar, the suggestion of Umar was that this is not the time to be merciful. Mercy is done when you're in power, not when you are struggling and you're still weak. Then you need to demonstrate. And so Allah Azza wa Jalla revealed in the Quran, مَا كَانَ لِنَبِيٍ أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُ أَسْرَى حَتَّى يُثْخِنَ فِي الْأَرْضِ Which was a similar sentiment to what Umar ibn Khattab uh, wanted. So this is another agreement. It is also reported in Sahih Muslim, in yet another incident. So this is now the fifth ayah. It is also reported in Sahih Muslim that when Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul died, his body was brought to the masjid on the janazah. And the Prophet ﷺ came to lead the janazah. And Umar stood between the body and the Prophet ﷺ. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah ﷺ, are you going to pray over Adu Allah? The one who said this and this on that day, and this and this on that day, and this and this on that day. So he began listing. I mean, this is Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. What has he not done? What phrases he said, the vulgarity, the ridicule, the mockery, the insinuations. He was the one who engineered almost the, the khandaq treachery. So many things, and everybody knows this. And Umar ibn Khattab says that, how can you pray for the messenger of Allah? Uh, how can you pray for the suffer Allah? How can you pray for the enemy of Allah, O messenger of Allah? And he listed all of these crimes that Abdullah bin Ubay had committed. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Leave me be, O Umar. Let me do what I'm doing, O Umar. For Allah gave me the choice and I have made my choice. What is the choice? This is an early revelation. Istaghfir lahum aw la tastaghfir lahum in tastaghfir lahum sab'ina narratan falan yaghfir Allah lahum. Seek forgiveness for the munafiqoon or don't seek forgiveness, you have the choice. Then Allah says, but no, even if you seek forgiveness 70 times, Allah will not forgive them. And the Prophet ﷺ said, if I knew that adding more than 70 would forgive them, I would add more than 70. If I knew 71 would forgive, I would do 71. So when the Prophet ﷺ said this, he then led the janazah, and he accompanied the body to Baqir and he entered the grave himself and he helped in burying Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul because he is rahmatan lil alameen because that is his nature because he wants forgiveness for everybody and Umar ibn Khattab began feeling very guilty what did I just do? how could I have questioned the judgment of the Prophet ﷺ? why was I standing between the body and him? like Basically saying that he should not be praying. So he goes, I and he began to feel, began to feel, the, and barely any time had passed before Allah revealed in the Quran. Surah Tawbah. Never pray for any one of them, whoever dies, and never stand at their graves. So this is the later prohibition that forbade the Muslims from praying over the known hypocrites. And the known hypocrites were few in number. The unknown hypocrites you pray over, if you don't know. But the known hypocrites, and Abdullah was a known hypocrite. So the prohibition came 
after Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu suggested this, that he should not pray for the, uh, for the hypocrites. And um, so this is what number now? Five. This is five. The sixth one that we find. The sixth one that we find. And this is not exhaustive, by the way. I'm just giving you some. And some scholars have made more than this. The sixth one that we find uh, is that once uh, the Prophet ﷺ sent a young boy to get Umar ibn Khattab and bring him. And uh, the young boy just barged into the house of Umar. And Umar was sleeping on his bed. And perhaps he wasn't dressed fully appropriately. It's his bed. It's his house. And so <clears throat> Umar ibn Khattab said to the Prophet ﷺ that, Ya Rasulullah, I wish Allah would reveal something about isti'dhan, about permission. Like, what is the rulings about permission? And so, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed, Ya ayu alladheen amnu li yasta'adhinkum alladheena malakat imanukum walladheen lam yablughu al-hulum alikum thalatha marrat. Which is the verse in Surah Nur that deals with isti'dhan. <coughs> that deals with permission. That you're not allowed to enter without getting permission. And um, even those in your household, young children and whatnot, especially uh, the young children and whatnot, they should have three timings you should teach them. Never enter. And anyone other than them that's older, at all times they have to get permission. But the young children, they should be taught these are the times you do not enter. So this was revealed because of Umar's request to the Prophet ﷺ that, O Messenger of Allah, how I wish Allah would reveal something about uh, permission of entering. And there's another, uh, so this is number six now, right? So number seven, and this one... Um, it's not mentioned in the books of hadith, but it is mentioned in some of the early books of, of tafsir, that it is mentioned that Umar ibn al-Khattab uh, wanted clarification about alcohol, khamr. He wanted clarification about khamr. And so Allah revealed in the Quran, the first verse that was revealed about khamr, that uh, Allah says in the Quran, there's some benefit and uh, some uh, harm, and the, benefit and the harm always the benefit, right? That there's a lot of harm and some benefit. And the harm outweighs the benefit. So Umar said, Oh Allah, we want shafi kafi. We want bayan that is clear. This is still ambiguous. So Allah revealed in the Quran, Oh you believe, do not come to the prayer while you're drunk. And so in the adhan for a few months or however many long time, there was a phrase that said, Do not come to the salah if you are drunk. So the people need to be told, Don't come if you're drunk. But Umar said, Oh Allah, we want bayan and shafi and kafi, and we want a clear, explicit verdict. This is still ambiguous and vague. What is the clear verdict about khamr? And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then revealed the third verse about alcohol, and that is, Ya ayyuhaladid amanu, innam al khamru wal maysiru wal ansabu wal azlamu, rijisu min amri shaitani fajatani buhu. All of these things are evil, avoid them. And so Umar al Khattab said, We are avoiding them, we are avoiding them. Now, this might not be at the request of Umar. It could be that Umar wants more bayan. And so Allah Azza wa Jal is uh, clarifying. In any case, the point is Umar is linked to the story. Umar is linked to the story of the verses of um, alcohol. And Umar al-Khattab is a well-known sahabi when it comes to the tafsir of the Qur'an. Uh, Umar was indeed one of the most knowledgeable sahaba of the Qur'an and its interpretation. And we learn this from so many a hadith from so many a hadith that mention that mention Umar's knowledge of the Quran. Um, of them uh, is that a number of times Umar is asked questions about verses, and he already says, "I asked the Prophet the exact same thing," or "I know the, the meaning of this verse," which shows that Umar al-Khattab was very concerned about tafsir directly from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. In Sahih Muslim, we read the hadith that Yada ibn Umayya, one of the Sahaba, he asks Umar ibn al-Khattab. That, O oh, Amir al Mu'minin, when he's the Khalifa, O oh, Amir al Mu'minin, Allah mentions in the Quran that Qasr should only be done when we're scared of the enemy. In the Quran, Allah says in the Quran, فَلَيْسَ عَلَيْكُمْ جُنَاحٌ أَن تَقْصُوا مِنَ الصَّلَاةِ إِنْ خِفْتُمْ أَنْ يَفْتِنَكُمْ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا If you're worried that somebody's going to attack you, then go ahead and do Qasr. Umayyah said, Ya'la ibn Umayyah said, O oh, Amir al muminin why are we still doing Qasr when we're not worried about any attack? So the Qur'an does not mention Qasr except as a response to an attack. And 
Ya'la is asking, where do we get qasr from them? If we're not feeling worried. And Umar ibn al-Khattab said, I asked the Prophet the exact same question as you. And he said, Sadaqah from Allah, and Allah loves that you accept his sadaqah. Now this is the basis of all of the madahib that allow qasr, because the Quran does not mention qasr except in situations of war. But all madahib allow qasr in, for the musafir. Where do they get it from? From this hadith of Umar. And the fact that Umar asked the Prophet ﷺ the exact same question that Ya'la was interested in also demonstrates his uh, questioning. Uh, in another narration, uh, somebody asked Umar al-Khattab about another verse of the Quran. This is the famous verse of Surah Al-A'raf, verse 172, that uh, the verse of the covenant, the mithaq of Adam, that when your Lord took the mithaq of Adam, وَإِذَخَذَ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَنِي آدَمْ مِنْ ظُهْرِمْ ذُرِّيَتَهُمْ وَإِشْهَدَهُمْ عَلَى فُسْهِمْ أَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ Am I not your Lord? And they said, yes, you are our Lord. So somebody asked Umar, what does this verse mean? What is the story behind this verse? So once again, Umar says that I heard the Prophet ﷺ being asked this, and this is what he said. And he then gave the whole hadith, which is a famous hadith of the mithaq, in that, uh, and we went over this with the class of Adam, that Allah created Adam, and then he rubbed his back, and then took out all of the children from his nasal, uh, from his uh, loins, and then he spread them in front of him. So this hadith, once again, Umar is the one interpreting it. And he's already asked the Prophet where he knows the interpretation from the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Wasallam. So, and, th- and there are at least another five or six narrations that um, I didn't want to get into. But the point is to demonstrate Umar's knowledge of tafsir and Umar's knowledge of the Quran. As for a hadith that deal with uh, Umar and fiqh that we learn and the status of Umar, the blessings of Umar is going to be next Wednesday. We'll talk about the fada'il of Umar and the hadith. So today we're just going to mention some ahadith that the rulings have come down to us basically because of Umar ibn Khattab's asking the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Of course, by the way, the famous hadith of Jibreel, Umar plays a prominent role in it, the hadith of Jibreel. Because at the end, who does the Prophet sallam ask? Do you know who the questioner is? It is Umar. He turns to Umar and he asks Umar, Oh Umar, do you know who the questioner is? And this is enough of an indication of the status of Umar. That the Prophet chose him and asked him, do you know who the questioner is? And uh, many a hadith are the basis of fiqh because Umar asked the Prophet or did something that the Prophet commanded him. Uh, otherwise, we would not have known of these rulings. Um, of them is the uh, ruling of gifting silk to others, women or non-Muslims. This is from the hadith of Umar. That the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Once Umar wanted him to, uh, Umar wanted to give the Prophet some something of silk, and the Prophet sallam said, "This is something that the people who don't believe in the akhirah wear. This is something for the people who don't have any share of the hereafter." Later on, the Prophet sallam gifted Umar some silk that had come in the booty. So Umar became concerned. He said, "O Messenger of Allah, you're the one who said that." The one who has no share of the hereafter wears silk, yet you gave me silk. So he's worried, are you implying I'm not going to have my share of the hereafter? And the Prophet said, I didn't mean it for you to use personally. It means you don't have to wear it yourself, you can give it to others. Women are allowed to wear silk, others. And so Umar gifted silk to a non-Muslim brother, he gave it to him. He had a brother in Mecca who was not a Muslim and he sent the silk to him. So the point being that we learned from this. Yes, of course, men can touch silk, can gift it, can use it for other purposes other than themselves wearing it or benefiting from it. We also have the hadith uh, of, the, uh, of Umar bin Khattab that he said, I gave a horse in charity to somebody whom I thought would use it fi sabilillah in a war. But I saw that he neglected the animal and he didn't take care of it. So I wanted it back. So I was going to ask him, how much is he going to sell it to me back for? And I'll take it back. Then I said, let me ask the Prophet ﷺ this. So he went to the Prophet ﷺ and told him the whole story. And the Prophet ﷺ said to him, do not take it back. Even if he sells you the horse for a dirham, for a a coin. Even if he sells it for dirham, for the one who takes back his gift or sadaqah is like the dog who takes his vomit back. All of us know this hadith. 
the hadith of taking something back once you've given it. And this, where do we get it from? Umar's fiqh, Umar's taqwa, Umar's asking the Prophet He's not doing anything without asking the Prophet what should I be doing? Another uh, incident that Umar asked the Prophet and from it we base an entire chapter of fiqh on. This is one of the main hadith that we have. Uh, that we base it on this chapter of fiqh. What is it dealing with? So Umar ibn Khattab owned a garden and he wanted to give the garden in charity. So he went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and he asked him, who should I give this garden to? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, keep the garden as is and give the proceeds to the fuqara and the orphans and the needy and don't give the garden to anybody else. Neither you can benefit from it, nor anybody else can benefit from it, but the proceeds will be given to the fuqara. What is this called? Waqf. Waqf. And this hadith of Umar is one of only two hadith about waqf. Waqf only has two or three hadith, that's it. And this hadith of Umar is one of the hadith that opens the door for endowment. We learn what an endowment is because of just two or three hadith, and this is one of them. That Umar bin Khattab was one of the first people to start an endowment. And uh, also the, 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 the dua that is said when you wear new clothes. What is that dua? This dua was said to Umar bin Khattab. What is the dua? So our Prophet ﷺ saw uh, Umar bin Khattab wearing a nice white thawb. So he asked him, Oh Umar, is this a new garment or is this a washed garment that looks so good? So he said, No, this is a washed garment. So our Prophet ﷺ said, Ilbis jadidan wa ish hamidan wa mut shahidan. Wear good new clothes. May you always be of those who are wearing new clothes. And live a honorable and good life. And die the death of a shaheed. So the Prophet made this dua for him, and of course, all of it, of course, became, all of it became true. So this is the dua that we say when we were in clothes. It was actually Umar ibn Khattab was the one who is the recipient of it, and we learn it because of him. Um, the final point, inshallah, before we conclude, um, and that is, of course, one of the most important aspects of Umar ibn Khattab was that he was one of the uh, father-in-laws of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam because of Hafsa because of his eldest daughter, Hafsa. And of course, Hafsa is his eldest child, and that's why his kunya is Abu Hafs. His kunya is Abu Hafs, because Hafsa is his eldest daughter. And the marriage to Hafsa took place in Sha'ban of the third year of the Hijrah. And Hafsa had been married once before, and uh, she did not have any children from her previous husband. Her previous husband was one of the earliest converts, who performed the hijrah to Abyssinia. He participated in Badr. He was one of the small handful of Sahaba who died at Badr. So Hafsa's husband is a shaheed of Badr. Hafsa's husband is a shaheed of Badr. And so uh, after Badr, she becomes basically uh, a widow. And she is probably 20, 21 years old at this time. She becomes a widow. And so this was the famous incident where... Uh, the, uh, Umar, Umar al Khattab is thinking of who does he think of? Uthman and Abu Bakr. First Uthman, then Abu Bakr. Like, who should I give my daughter to? So he uh, suggests this to Uthman, and Uthman thinks about it for a while, and then he says that it has now appeared to me that it is not the time for me to get married. So this hurt him because obviously, I mean, he was hoping that Uthman would be a son-in-law to him and, and to establish the bonds. So then he asked Abu Bakr. And Abu Bakr as well said that, I don't think it is best for me to get married right now. And he goes, this hurt me more than Uthman's rejection had hurt me. And afterwards, then the Prophet ﷺ proposed to Hafsa. Then Abu Bakr said, oh Umar, perhaps when you had spoken to me about Hafsa, you felt something in your heart? He said, yes, I did. So he said, the Prophet ﷺ had asked us about Hafsa. What do we think? So we knew that he was interested. And because of his interest, we could not. But we could not tell you the secret of the Prophet as well. I would not be one to tell you the secret of the Prophet as well. So uh, Hafsa became the 
what number wife who can remind me because we went over all of these so many times Three, four, fifth, sixth, sixth, seventh now. Just keep on going, huh? Who's the first wife, obviously, is? Khadija. Who's the second wife? Sauda. Third wife? Aisha. Hafsa is the fourth. Hafsa is the fourth, okay? Hafsa is the fourth wife of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And... Um, uh, we will talk about the story of Hafsa and, and the details of Hafsa when we get to the Ummahat al Mu'minin. And the final point, absolute final point, inshallah, that another very important incident that took place regarding Umar uh, and uh, the Prophet Sallallahu is that he was the one who um, intervened, not intervened, he was the one who got involved when the Prophet was having a dispute with his wives. Out of all of the Sahaba, none of them had that status to talk to him about what's going on. And he was the one who eventually managed to enter into that small room that was a chamber in, uh, of, of the masjid. So there was a chamber uh, in the masjid of the Prophet you would have to use a ladder to get into it. Small little room uh, in the masjid of the Prophet And when the Prophet uh, had this dispute with his wives for an entire month, he slept one month in that chamber. And the entire city of Medina was hurt and confused. But who's going to get involved? Who is going to become now, you know, in between this? And Abu, uh, Umar was the one who went to Hafsa first and foremost, and then to the other wives of the Prophet to get what's happening from them. And not just to get out, to rebuke them, to, to say, what are you doing? How could you do this to the Prophet? Then he was the one who finally entered into that room because nobody even had the audacity to ask permission to go in. And he was the one who was given permission. That's when he saw how the Prophet was living. The famous story, you all know, that he saw the Prophet did not even have a bed. Uh, and he just had a pot of water and just a bamboo stick that he's sleeping on. And he began to cry uh, that he's sleeping like this for so many weeks uh, in this room. And he says, O oh, Messenger of Allah, uh, Allah has blessed Kisra and, 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 and the Caesar with so much. Why don't you ask Allah to bless you? And that's when the Prophet stood up from his bamboo stick and said, are you in doubt, Ibn al-Khattab? Do you not understand what we are doing here? Are you in doubt? Don't you realize Allah has given them this dunya and he's given us the akhirah? And then as the conversation goes on, he lightens up the mood by, uh, because it's a tense situation. The Prophet is, is having a dispute with his wives. And of course, uh, the main point of dispute was what? Was the standards of living that the wives were demanding uh, more and the Prophet does not want to give them, he wants to go to the Fuqara. And that's why Allah revealed in the Quran that if you want this dunya, come and I'll give it, but you'll have to go your separate ways. But if you want Allah and His Messenger and the next life, then this is what I have to offer you. And of course, all of this, I mean, side point here, but the, the, the Prophet had to be that role model for us. He had to be that role model that is, frankly, almost impossible for anybody to reach, but that's why he is Rasulullah That even his wives have to sacrifice for him. And so they were given the choice. The point being, the situation is very tense, they don't know what to do. And Umar bin Khattab was the one who, he's trying to break the ice, and so uh, he cracks some jokes about the women. Because that's what men do about the women, and women do about the men. This is the reality, right? Women always put their men and husbands down, and, and Men as well, they talk about men never ever mention their wives, by the way. They mention women. Okay? <laughs> big difference. Whereas women will mention their husbands. You know what my husband did? Right? This is a big psychological difference between men and women. Uh, so Umar al Khattab is now talking about women to cheer the process and up. And he says, I miss the good old days, Ya Rasulullah. In Mecca, our women were obedient, silent, subservient. If we said something, they did it immediately. Then we came to Medina, and these Ansari ladies, they ruined all of our wives. And they taught them to respond back to us and to argue with us, you know. I want the good old days back. And the Prophet ﷺ smiled. And Umar al-Khattab said, this was the big burden lifted that I could see him smile. Like just to see the Prophet smile now, so it's as if, alhamdulillah, 
I'm making progress. And then bit by bit, bit by bit, until finally, did you divorce your wives, O Messenger of Allah? No, I haven't. Allahu Akbar, from that room, the whole Sahaba heard. Like he's so happy, he got the answer. The wives have not been divorced. Okay? His takbir was so loud, everybody in the masjid knew that this is good news. That the wives have not been divorced. So again, who is the person who did that? That is Umar ibn Khattab. And again, this shows us the maqam of Umar ibn Khattab. And inshallah, next Wednesday, we'll continue uh, talking about the fadila or the blessings of Umar. And also, one or two incidents in the, in the, in the khilaf of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. We just have a little bit. And then some major incidents in his lifetime. And again, I reiterate what I have said before. And that is that uh, this is not a, a detailed biography of the Khulafa al-Rashidun like we did with the Prophet ﷺ Sirah. Rather, it is bits and pieces, a holistic survey. And even with the Khulafa, we're going into more detail. Once we finish the Khulafa, we'll choose the rest of the Sahaba, maybe just one lecture per Sahabi, if even that. Some Sahaba, we don't even have that much. We might have to do two Sahaba per day. So it depends on how much we have. And then, inshaAllah ta'ala, we'll move to the uh, mothers of the believers, Ummahat al Mu'minin, inshaAllah ta'ala. Uh, any quick questions about what we've done today before we break for Isha? Yes? No, it's not at all. Endowments can be for anybody. You are the person who is in charge of the endowment, you are the one who gets to decide. Uh, you, you are the one who gets to decide who uses the endowment. So, for example, you can say that uh, when I die, this garden shall be used for the orphans of this particular madrasa. Or you can say it will be used for the fuqara of this city. Or you can say it will be used for my family members who are poor. You, as the person who chooses the endowment, has the right to put all the conditions that you want on it. And it can be as specific or as general as you want. No, of course you can have endowments for the mosque. Of course you can. It's no, no, of course not. Historically speaking, the reason why scholarship and masjids flourished in Islam was not because of the state, it was because of the endowments. Historically speaking, uh, the reason why scholarship was independent, one of the biggest problems that has taken place is that in the last 150 years, after the advent of colonialism, the awqaf was acquired by the governments. And what the used to be independent became dependent upon the government. Simple example of Azhar, for example, not to be controversial, but less than a hundred years ago was when Azhar was acquired by the government. And there was a huge rebellion by the ulama of Azhar. They didn't want to be acquired. Because once you're acquired, you're in big trouble. You are salaried employees. You cannot speak your mind. You have influence, so on and so forth. Our ulama... How did our ulama used to live once upon a time? Who would take care of them? That's the beauty of the classical system. It was independent. Once you are associated with the madrasa, with his masjid, so people will leave endowments for the madrasa. And they will say, when I die, this building will be rented out and the profits will go to the running of the madrasa. So the madrasa board is getting money from different sources and they don't have to respond to a politician, a sultan, an amir. They are independent. And so ulama flourished because of this. The salaries of the khatibs and imams was not the government, was not the khulafa. Unfortunately, this is the modern reality of most countries in the Arab and Muslim world. Correct? So when the government is paying your salary, guess what? your khutbah is influenced by your salary. It's human nature, right? And this is one of the biggest problems that has happened, that you, and the fact of the matter is we also have the same issue here in North America where a lot of times the masjid board will control what the imam says, right? Where the imam cannot be independent. Alhamdulillah, I am independent, don't worry. Alhamdulillah. 
that was my one of my first conditions alhamdulillah and alhamdulillah this is the reality as well alhamdulillah as you all know and this is bifadillah ta'ala upon uh, allah's blessings on all of us alhamdulillah that uh, in this community alhamdulillah we are very very blessed but the fact of the matter is let's be real here how common is it that the imam says something that is too strict for the community the board doesn't like it and then the, he gets fired because why because the board did not like what the imam said. So what's going to happen? The imams learn, keep quiet, and preach the version of Islam that the board wants. What type of benefit will come from the ummah in this matter? So this is one of the biggest benefits of the awqaf system. This was the benefit of the awqaf system that caused our ummah to flourish. And one of the causes of decline of the ulama was the destruction of the awqaf. And the acquirement of the governments of what the awqaf used to do. Even in the khilafah, building masjids and madrasas and the salaries of the religious clergy was not under the khalifa. And this is of the biggest blessings of Allah upon the ummah. Because you don't want it linked together. Anyway, I went into a long tangent, but that was to answer your question, we need to revive this concept. And again, there's actually books written on this. The concept of an endowment is Islamic. The Western world did not know what an endowment is. It did not know what an endowment is. It is an Islamic concept that was then acquired by the Western institutions and then they built upon it and they took it to a different level. But the, in reality, the first civilization to have something like an endowment where the asl or the structure remains and the prophets benefit something else. And nobody can sell or buy or acquire the asl, whether it's a garden, whether it's a building, in our case, an amount of money which is in stocks, for example. That amount cannot be touched. This is new in human civilization. Nobody before these ahadith of Umar and others gave that principle. And that's why it's so important that we understand and thank Umar al-Khattab for opening this door. Inshallah, we will conclude here, inshallah.